I prepared a talk, a fantastic talk for, uh, for you um, on the topic of being more productive at work, since we're talking about the future of work. And then it was also Thanksgiving. And I, um, we have three children, and they wanted to watch a movie. We were at our summer cottage, which doesn't have internet and only very few DVDs. And the only one we could find was 2001 Space Odyssey. And now you may recall that there's a very prominent actor in, in the movie who's non-human, HAL 9000, the artificial intelligence, uh, which turns out to create a lot of problems for the, for the characters in the film. And the next morning, uh, I was preparing my talk on being more productive at work while the children were watching the movie, and I was kind of eyeing them, and I, and I was surprised that they were able to watch it all the way through because it's a very long film. And um, the next morning, my daughter, who's nine, woke, had woken up early, and uh, at breakfast, we noticed she had made a drawing, and there's foxes in the woods um, where we live. And, and she likes to draw the foxes doing various things. Except this time, there was something different about the drawing. There were the foxes, um, but the foxes had a machine called Fox Finder 900, um, who was an AI. Um, and I don't really know the relationship between the foxes and, and, the, and, the, and the AI, but it didn't seem like things were, were going well for the foxes. And, uh, it got me thinking about my talk, because what I suddenly realized was that much of, um, and we like to talk about humanizing technology. I like to talk about humanizing technology and artificial intelligence and these things. Um, but actually, a lot of what goes on in reality under that moniker of humanizing technology really isn't about making technology more human. I think it's about making us more mechanical. Um, we're learning to think like computers. Our children are learning to interact and, and be more like machines. And I decided to change the title of my talk. Um, and instead, I'd like to invite you to consider how to be more human uh, for the next 10 minutes, um, and about your own goals in life. Um, and one way to address this that I found very useful was to actually look at what people who are at the very end of their lives have to say when they look back on their own lives. Um, and here are some things that, that they say. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life that was true to myself, not the life that was expected of me. I wish I didn't work so hard. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And I wish that I had let myself be happier. Now, when I read these results from this research paper, this one puzzled me the most. What does it really mean to let yourself be happier? And I, I th I've been thinking about that for a while. Um, and by the way, interestingly enough, what was curiously absent was that no one wished they had worked more. And so, I'll give you 10 things that I've found from research that will help you be happier, should you choose. And I ask you to think about yourself um, now, and specifically one thing that you know you're good at. I don't know what it, maybe it's washing dishes, maybe it's, or cooking. Um, in our family, I'm, I'm excellent at tidying up, while my partner is better at actually doing the creative work of the food. 
um, but something that you get satisfaction out of. And then how often do you actually get to do that? Another thing that um, I love doing um, is skateboarding, actually. I love to skateboard. Um, and I didn't realize how I had missed that until my, my son, who's now 10, started skateboarding. And now I get to go with him. And suddenly, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm not as good as I used to be, but um, it's still something that I realized I loved um, and had kind of forgotten about. Um, because I've been so involved in my work uh, for many years. And so it's something that I have to thank my, uh, my son for, is for reminding me of, of that, that forgotten skill that I had. Here's another one. Think about one person who you love and like, and then how much time are you spending with them? Is there a way that you could perhaps spend less time with the people that you feel like you have to spend time with um, and more time with the people who you'd actually like to spend time with. Now this one's curious. Um, don't take on other people's problems. I don't think this is a problem for everyone, but is there someone or something in your life that's troubling you that you're spending a lot of time on? that really, perhaps, isn't your problem at all. And then one of the most powerful and rather obvious things that correlates with happiness is the time it takes you to travel to work. Just that commute. Is there a way that you could walk or at least take public transit? Because it has a strong correlation with your overall happiness and well-being. Here in Finland, I think it's a privileged place because many people can actually do this, whereas, especially in the US and Bay Area where I spend most of my time, um, this is a constant sore spot for almost everyone. People spend incredible amounts of time commuting. And then paying favors forward, helping other people reach their goals um, is one of the most powerful ways to actually make yourself feel satisfied and give you that idea that your life is actually meaningful. What can you do today? Is there something, some email you can send, tw take 20 seconds to help someone else? It's actually what this conference should be all about, right? So perhaps before leaving the conference area today, uh, make, do that one thing for someone else. And then this one, particularly for, I'm someone who I, I'm kind of brood, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to always live in the moment because I'm always worried about what's going to happen in the future. Um, and I was very surprised when um, I read this study that said, actually, one of the best things you can do when your mind is wandering and you can't really help it and it feels kind of overpowering nowadays because everyone's meditating and seems to be very in the present. Um, and if I'm one of those people who really has trouble with that because my mind just keeps wandering. Um, but this idea that you can actually look forward to something good, which I've started consciously doing, sometimes it's a family trip, or some other thing that I know is coming up that I can, or that I can arrange for myself. Um, I'll give you one example. It's every Wednesdays now in, in San Francisco, there aren't very many good saunas. Obviously, there's a wealth of good saunas. Even here, just in Mesukeskus, there's probably more saunas than in all of San Francisco. But every Wednesday, I go to the gym, and then um, there's a place where there's a Finnish sauna. It's not a good sauna on Finnish standards, but it's more like a kerrostalo sauna, we'd say. But it's the best one I've found in San Francisco. And every Wednesday, I go there, and I look forward to that. Um, and then this other thing, it's like actually thinking about your own going away is, turns out, makes you, makes you feel better about yourself. Um, thinking about death, of all things, makes you happier. Um, now, this one's rather obvious, but I uh, 
kind of belaboring the point, more money will not improve your moment-to-moment -moment mood. It's more likely that after there's a curve, you know, if uh, you know after you make a certain amount of money, um, no matter how much more you make, it doesn't really seem to affect your happiness. Your time and energy are probably better spent else elsewhere. Um, avoid doing something that's easy and strive to do something that's ambitious. Now, this is again something that seems rather obvious to a group of entrepreneurs like yourselves. Um, but is it really, are you really working on something ambitious? Um, a little while ago, I met someone who actually visited Finland too, a young guy who's working on a project to clean up all the plastic in the world's oceans. Um, and after having dinner with him, um, I lie in bed thinking, wow, that, he's, he's really ambitious. He's 22 years old and he wants to clean up all the plastic in the world's oceans. Hmm. Can I do something as, as ambitious as that? Could I? You know, and even if he only gets 10% of the way there, he's cleaned up 10% of the plastic in all of the world's oceans. Um, that in itself would be a huge thing. So working on a project that has that kind of ambition gives you that drive, that motivation, um, because it feels meaningful. And I noticed this especially in medicine where um, having worked specifically with um, issues related to cancer, um, it's a very dark world for cancer patients. But at the same time, for the people who are working on um, helping patients, and it always strikes me that they don't have to get up in the morning and wonder if what they're spending their day on is actually going to be useful, which is what some of my friends in Silicon Valley, who are these high-flying technology executives with fantastic salaries and kind of all the you know, widgets and gadgets in the world, um, I feel sometimes secretly worry about, is that they're not actually working on anything that matters. Um, and then this one is my favorite. Having those positive illusions about how awesome your romantic partner is. Um, and this, this, we spend so much of our times on screens. And, and you all know this. And, and uh, I've talked about this before, too, with some, some of you. Is, you know, even in bed, we lie there and we're on our screens. You know? um, we're touching each other less. It's kind of a crazy thing to say, right? But we should be touching each other more, our romantic partners. Um, so just that touch. Um, it's one of the most powerful things that we have at our disposal. And it's completely free um, and so easy. And yet, we're choosing our devices over that, um, that, that power we have just as humans. So be conscious about choosing sometimes, often, more often, to reach out to the other, your partner, rather than reach out to your device. And then this is something that's interesting. I have been recently studying uh, storytelling with our daughter, who's 10. She writes stories of her own. And one of the things she asked me that I thought was a very good question was after watching a particularly sad story, or it was a, you know, a book and a movie, she said, why do, why do people make tragedies? We were talking about what are tragedies. Because they're so sad. There's, it's tragic. And I thought about the Greek and how that form came about. And I was reminded of a study I once read about people who were interviewed after watching a happy movie and then, you know, wait a little bit and you would see how happy they felt about themselves. And then people who watched a sad movie. And it turned out that immediately after watching a happy movie, everybody felt great. They felt fantastic. But a little while later, when they were comparing themselves 
with the people in this movie. They actually felt worse about themselves in comparison. And in the opposite way, watching someone have a tragic time in a movie actually make you feel better about yourself in relation to them a little bit later. So only compare yourself to those worse off than you, if you must compare. So I think it's a great advice. And then lastly, and this may involve adopting or fostering, but having children, you know, provenly, and I know this, I'm, you know, I have experienced this uh, kind of the deep end myself of uh, the years will be tough, but then you will grow old feeling that your life is full of meaning. Um, And having said all these things, it feels like here we are, and we're supposed to be talking about success and making it at work, making it in tech. Um, what can we say about success? And I'm just going to leave you with this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, except it turns out it wasn't Emerson, it was a woman, as it often happens, who wrote this in, and everyone thought it was Emerson. And this is what she wrote. To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a little bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed easier because you've lived. This is to have succeeded. Thank you.